As you know, we have a special guest briefer today, General Steve Lyons, Commander of U.S. Transportation Command, and I'm going to turn it over to the General in just a minute uh, to update you on the incredible effort that Trans Transportation Command uh, and all their subordinate uh, commands and, and air crews are expending uh, on uh, trying to get as many people out of Afghanistan as possible. So he'll have his uh, he'll have a, a brief set of comments, and then we'll start taking questions. But before I do that, I do want to give just an update on Haiti, if you don't mind. Uh, Life-saving aid and assistance continues arriving uh, as our Joint Task Force Haiti under U.S. Southern Command continues to move people and equipment uh, to ease the suffering uh, of the people of Haiti. To date, Joint Task Force Haiti has conducted more than 200 missions, saved more than 300 people, and delivered over 88,000 pounds of vital aid as Department of Defense capabilities and U.S. Coast Guard assets, which are now underneath the JTF, the Joint Task Force, continue to rapidly respond uh, uh, by de delivering aid assistance where it's most needed. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, U.S. government assets uh, are providing unique air, medical, and logistical capabilities uh, under the DHEF. They include 19 helicopters, both U.S. military and Coast Guard, uh, a U.S. Coast Guard C-130 and an HC-144, two U.S. Navy P-8 maritime reconnaissance aircraft, uh, the U.S. naval ship Burlington, which is providing Scan Eagle, so more uh, uh, eyes on overhead, uh, the USS Billings providing a refueling station afloat, the USS Arlington providing refueling and logistics, and two U.S. Coast Guard cutters, uh, the Coast Guard cutters uh, Tampa and Reliance. Um, we are, of course, working with allies and partners as well in this whole of government uh, effort in support of USAID. So there are uh, many nations like Great Britain, France, Netherlands, uh, contributions from uh, neighboring nations, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, Chile, Panama, Argentina, the Dominican Republic. I'm sorry, I mentioned that one already. Costa Rica, Mexico, and Spain. Uh, we know there is much, much more work to do in Haiti to uh, help the Haitian people, uh, and we're committed to, to, to being there and to doing that uh, for as long as possible. Uh, we're very proud of uh, all the men and women of the department that are assisting in this effort uh, and truly making a difference on, on the ground. And speaking of making a difference on the ground and, and, and making a difference uh, through U.S. military capabilities, I do want to now uh, turn the microphone over to General Steve Lyons, again, Commander of U.S. Transportation Command. And he'll have some opening comments, and then we'll get to Q&A. I will come back to the podium and monitor the Q&A. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, we, we have a limited amount of time with the general. He's obviously got a lot on his plate today, so we'll try to keep it moving. And uh, with that, uh, General, sir, can you hear me, and are you ready to go? Uh, John, I got you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, loud and clear. It's uh, The floor is yours, sir. Hey, uh, thank you, sir. Hey, hey I'm, I'm pleased to join you today, as well as the press, to talk about Transcom's role in this monumental logistics effort supporting non-combatant evacuation operations. I just would say that from the time Transcom received orders to commence deployment, initial elements were airborne in less than three hours. These forces were critical to quickly secure the Kabul International Airfield. Simultaneously, we commenced support to NEO operations and continue around the clock operations to ensure the safe evacuation of American citizens, our Afghan friends, and those cleared by the State Department. I'm just reminded that the United States is the only nation capable of rapidly deploying forces and providing nonstop airlift operations at this scale. I'd like to specifically highlight the role of our outstanding air component, the Air Mobility Command, led by General Jackie Van Ovost. Air Mobility Command continues to operate the C-17s you see in your news footage. Less visible but equally important is their contingency response group operating at the Kabul airport and a multitude of other forces providing en route support. This incredibly dedicated team of Air Force professionals is the best in the world. I did have the opportunity this week to speak with the crew, call sign Reach 871, the C-17 flight that carried the 823 Afghans from Kabul to safety. The iconic photo of hundreds of Afghans on the floor of a C-17 illustrates the desperation, fear, and uncertainty of the Afghan people, but also the life-saving capability and compassion of our military members. These Herculean efforts underscore the United States' commitment to our Afghan allies and provide them an opportunity for a new beginning, a safer life, and a better future. To be clear, this is a global effort. I want to thank our many, many coalition partners. We could not be successful without the more than two dozen like-minded nations that expand our global logistics network 
by providing important access and transit centers. And finally, I want to acknowledge and thank our industry partners who, re who routinely provide airlift and supportive defense needs. Many of you reported on the Secretary's decision to activate Stage 1 of the Silver Reserve Air Fleet, and we greatly appreciate the teamwork and contributions of our commercial aviation partners. Let me just close by saying that for me, like all of our veterans who served in Afghanistan, this mission is very personal. I assure you that we will not rest until the military is complete, the mission is complete, and we have evacuated Americans who are seeking to be evacuated and as many Afghan partners as humanly possible. I could not be more proud of the Transcom team, our relationship with U.S. Central Command, and our contribution to this vitally important effort. And John, I'll be happy to take any questions the press may have. Thank you. Thank you, General. We'll uh, start with the Bob Burns Associated Press. Uh, thank you, General. Yeah, this is Bob Burns with AP. Um, thank you very much. A couple of questions. Um, currently, what is, a, what is your uh, maximum capacity for airlifting out of Kabul Airport in terms of the number of people you can get out in a single day based on the uh, aircraft and crews and so forth that you have available to you as of today? And the second question is regarding fuel. I'm wondering if you could describe how you're managing to keep sufficient fuel on hand at the airport given the limitations um, of that facility. Thanks. Yeah, Bob, thanks for the questions. Let me take fuel first. Uh, we do manage fuel and uh, we, are, we, we intentionally do not take fuel on on the ground. So we, we make sure we have enough fuel uh, to go in and go out without taking fuel on so we don't stress the logistics uh, posture uh, there and and if the legs are longer coming out, uh, will aerial re you know will provide aerial refuel and route uh, if necessary. We had last 24 hours as you saw on the news, uh, more than 10,000, well more than 10,000 evacuees moved. I'm very very confident that we'll we'll sustain that effort and improve that effort. To be honest with you, my commitment is to ensure that airlift is never the constraint uh, in this operation. And, and, and as you know and appreciate, and I've seen your reporting, I mean, airlift is extremely important, uh, but uh, critical to the throughput is also ground operations. And we're trying to synchronize that as we go. But we are, we are clearly razor focused on clearing the Kabul International Airport of every evacuee that can move. Tara? Thank you for doing this, General Lyons. Could you talk a little bit about the threat that your aircraft are facing as they fly into and fly out of Kabul. We've seen a French cargo plane have to uh, shoot out flares as it was taking off. What are your crews uh, preparing for, and can you put this in context of other threat environments that your cargo aircraft have had to fly into over the last couple of years? Yeah, thank you. I mean, the, th the threat is significant. As, as you know, I won't get into details. We're closely aligned to CENTCOM and other agencies on threat reporting and potential threat to airlift operations. I would just say as we watch that, uh, you know, our, our, our crews are the best in the world. Uh, that, that machine, the C-17, is the best in the world. And, and, and I'm confident that we're taking the right measures to mitigate the threat and we're connected to the right sources and taking the right kind of measures. And I'll, I'll probably leave it at that uh, for, for reasons, for good reasons. And, uh, Ground operations. Um, we were discussing earlier today at the briefing about just the one hour on the ground quick rotation. Can you talk about how the, you're managing that, how the planes and the crews are managing that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's quite remarkable. Um, you know, we've got uh, a, a number of planes in the system, but we have twice as many crews. And the idea is to keep those planes moving all, all the time, either by extending the crew day or preferably by swapping crews and keeping the iron in motion. And so there's a very, uh, you know, there's a very tight detail management system to do that. Critical to that, of course, is what you mentioned, which is ground time. The faster we can turn, either load or discharge, the faster we can turn that aircraft. And, and we're razor focused on, on bringing down, and I, I really appreciate the work ongoing in, in Afghanistan to bring down the time on ground to under an hour. Nancy. Can you give us a sense how you foresee the mission um, changing as the U.S. draws down the number of ground forces in Afghanistan in the final days of the month, and what the mission will look like if there is one post August 31st? Yeah, I mean, every day we take as the day comes. Um, 
we are we are razor focused on Neo. Uh, we know uh, and are linked very closely with Central Command on potential operations to close out the mission by the 31st. That was the direction given by the president, and we're committed to do that. And my commitment is to ensure that airlift is never the constraint to execute those operations. And we're, we're well synced with, with, with uh, Cent Central Command, uh, have a great relationship, uh, great teamwork. And so I, I think we're, we, 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 are, we, are, we are pushing the limits uh, to do everything we can to get every single evacuee uh, out of Kabul. Do you foresee fewer flights in the, say, the 28th, 29th, 30, 31st of the month as there are fewer ground forces, presumably, in Kabul? Well, I, I prefer not to get into numbers of flights by day. I, I would not uh, say that uh, we're going to let up. We're, we're not going to let up, uh, a, a, you know, full accelerator. Uh, we're, we're not going to let up. As long as there's a mission to be accomplished, uh, we'll be out there. I forgot to ask you to introduce yourselves because the general can't see you. So, uh, Courtney. Um, hey, General Lyons. This is Courtney QB calling. Uh, calling. This is Courtney QB from NBC News. Uh, you said that you're pushing the limits. Um, can you just g explain a little bit more what you mean by that when you say you're pushing the limits to get as many people out? And then are you able to kind of give us like a big picture look at how many um, C-17s and C-130s out of the total Air Force fleet are dedicated to this mission right now out of the to entire U.S. military fleet? Well, it's a, you know, it's a, all mobility resources are focused on this on this effort. Um, there's a number of ways I could cut the numbers that might not be helpful to you, to be honest. Um, you know, right now, the air component has uh, uh, well over 200 aircraft uh, committed to operations. Some, some of these are, uh, even KC-10s are committed to the operation in some way or some uh, fashion. So uh, when, I say, when I say we're all in, uh, I mean to, to present, to uh, meet the President and the Secretary's directive to ensure that every evacuee that is cleared and uh, cleared to move can move. And, uh, and, and our crews are absolutely incredible. I, I won't lie to you, they're tired. Uh, they're probably exhausted in some cases. I know that the leaders from time to time are pulling uh, crews out to make sure we don't have safety issues, but they are motivated, they are fired up, and they are committed to complete this mission. Can you ask one more about um, any COVID mitigation efforts that you're taking? Are you doing anything to ensure that your crews are, are, are safe from COVID? And can you give us a little bit of the detail of what that, that is, that looks like? Well, all the, it's, it's a great question. You know, we shouldn't forget that we're doing this operation in the middle of a pandemic. So all, all the crews are obviously masking, uh, and, uh, but, but the Afghans that are, that are you know, on the aircraft uh, are not masked. So that's one mitigation. There is some, uh, some screening that occurs uh, before they load. And then as we reach the temporary safe havens, these other uh, hubs and lily pads, uh, there are there are uh, uh, resources being applied to further test uh, the evacuees upon arrival to these various uh, temporary safe havens. Are your, all of your crews vaccinated, or are they getting tested at, at, at periodically to, to ensure that they're safe? The, you know, the vast majority are certainly tested. I, I can't say conclusively that they all are. Uh, although, great news today from the from the FDA. So pretty soon they'll all be. Uh, vaccinated. Jennifer. General Lyons, Jennifer Griffin from Fox News. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the constraints you faced and how you resolved them? And also, in the last 24 hours, you've gotten 18,000 or 11,000 passengers out of Kabul, clearing the backlog. Are you concerned that there are not enough people cleared through into the airport that you may have to take off with empty planes? Is there any sign that you're having to take off because of that quick turnaround with empty planes? Uh, great question. Uh, not, not at this time. And, uh, you know, I'm in, we're in contact with CENCOM constantly. I talk to John McKenzie on a continuous basis, so we're synced up. Uh, and the idea is we'd never want to leave uh, Kabul Airport on an empty plane or even a partially full plane if we can avoid it. So we are we are not doing that. As a matter of fact, we're filling the aircraft uh, uh, to about 400, uh, 450 uh, uh, passengers in, in a floor load uh, configuration. 
Uh, I just say to the to the to your first questions, it's an excellent question. You know, any any time that we move this fast in an operation, there's going to be fog and friction, and it's you know it, it's it's trying to achieve equilibrium in a very large uh, network of not just a airplanes but ground operations and multiple uh, nodes throughout the network. And so there's a you know in, in initially it's it's moving quick. You're trying to grow capacity. You're you're moving as fast as you can. Sometimes you get a little ahead of yourself. And then it's trying to equalize out and uh, making sure you got a critical path open. Uh, but again, uh, right now, uh, we'll sacrifice the back end of the uh, of, all, of all the architecture and the nodes to make sure that we're clearing uh, Kabul International, and that's what we're doing now. I need to go to the phones. I haven't done that yet. Uh, Stephen Losey. Hi. Yes. Thanks very much. Uh, so there are the reports about the uh, some of the threats that ISIS has made. And I know you're not speaking about specific threat um, environments, but can you talk to us a little bit more about how the military has communicated with the Taliban regarding these threats? Are you telling the Taliban it's their responsibility to keep ISIS away from the airport? And what happens if ISIS decides to embarrass the Taliban by launching terrorist attacks on the perimeter or the civilians trying to get into the airport? Stephen, I'll take that. That's that's more appropriate for me, I think, than for General Lyons. Um, as we've talked about uh, many times uh, over the last several days, we are in uh, daily communication with Taliban leaders outside the airport, sometimes multiple times a day, uh, to again uh, deconflict as best uh, as we can, and to uh, help ensure uh, a healthy access to the air airfield uh, for American citizens in particular. Uh, and that co that, that communication uh, continues uh, to to happen. We are also uh, mindful of the threat that ISIS poses, and without speaking for the Taliban, it's, I think it's a safe assumption to assume that that they too are mindful uh, of that threat. Uh, I won't. Um, begin to uh, hypothesize uh, of what, what uh, could or could not happen. And I think you can understand that at the podium we wouldn't get into specific uh, intelligence streams or, or, uh, or what we're watching. Nobody wants to see um, anybody else hurt. And, and certainly nobody wants to see anything that could impact uh, our ability to continue to conduct this evacuation operation. All I would tell you is we're focused on this uh, every single day, hour by hour. We're monitoring the, the, uh, the threat environment very, very carefully. Um, and as I said, the communication with the Taliban continues. So, uh, Thank Laura. You, Thank you. This is Laura Seligman with Politico. First of all, can you tell us the total estimated cost of the evacuation? And then also... Can you explain the discrepancy between the state and DOD numbers on the number of people evacuated? State is saying 25,000 since the operation began, but Major General Taylor earlier today, I believe he said 37,000. So what is that discrepancy? The, the numbers question. I mean, I, I, I can't speak for, I don't know, uh, I don't know where the, the other number came from, but um, but I think we're all in the interagency. We're all tracking these numbers, uh, the numbers that we put out this morning. You, I think you saw the the, the White House actually put those numbers out uh, before we did. So uh, that 37,000 since uh, the 14th is is what we're we're counting on. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to the uh, general on your first question, uh, but. It's whatever the costs are going to be, Laura, are bigger than just the airlift. Um, and I can tell you that we don't have an estimate right now. Uh, our focus and uh, the focus of the entire interagency is to get as many people out as fast as we can and as safely as we can. Um, and we're not uh, let, letting uh, cost uh, drive the, the factor here, dr co cost drive uh, the operation. Uh, the operation is driving the operation and the need to do this uh, in a very urgent and orderly way. But I'll turn it over to the general if he has any more uh, data for you in terms of uh, the cost from his perspective. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't have said it any better than Mr. Kirby just said it. Uh, I mean, we're aware and we're tracking costs, but we're nowhere close to accumulating uh, that, that data for public dissemination. And I'm sure, Laura, that when, when all is said and done, I mean, uh, at the appropriate time, we'll certainly be able to provide an overall sense of what the, the, the cost is. I just would add that, that the, the real cost that we're focused on now is human life. That's the cost that we're focused on.
Therese. If I could just, if I could just follow up. Um, General Lyons, are you concerned about the Taliban's ultimatum that they issued if the U.S. has to stay past August 31st to complete the evacuation? And what is the plan to protect our forces and the evacuees in that case? Well, again, as I said, you know, we watch the, the, all, all risks and threats very closely. And, you know, I, I, I would defer to U.S. Central Command on most of the parts of those questions. We're in direct contact with them regularly, continuously. And then uh, we, you know, we have our own uh, processes and defensive measures and techniques, tech, tactics and procedures to, to take, uh, you know, to protect our crews and to protect their aircraft going in and out. We got time for two more. I'm going to go to Sylvie and then Therese. Go ahead, Sylvie. Um, hello, uh, General Sylvie Lantom from AFP. Uh, can you speak to us about uh, the cooperation with the Turkish forces at the airport? Uh, what kind of relationship do you have with them? Yeah, I I, uh, I would defer to U.S. Central Command for that question. Um, I would not be able to characterize the relationship uh, on the ground. I know there is a relationship, but I would not be able to characterize that for you. Sylvie, remember the, the, the Turks are on the ground, really more of a security perspective. And so it, it is really more of a central command relationship that, uh, that, they're, that they're managing with the Turks every day. The Turks are still there. And of course, you know uh, at what scale that we're there. Therese? Uh, yes. Oh, thank you, John. I'm Therese Garnier with Newsy. Um, General Lyons, um, are medics being provided for each flight? I know there's a um, concern about capacity because you're trying to get as many people on, but are medics being provided? And the reason why I ask that is because there are reports that a woman had a baby during one of the flights. And so do you have medics that will be on board that will be able to handle any sort of emergency situations that may come up if someone has a baby or, you know, falls and gets sick or something in that instance? Yeah, it's a great question. We, we do not have medics on every flight. Uh, there is a medical screen uh, as part of the screening and boarding process. And uh, but I'll confess to you that many people would have to self-identify any kind of medical issue. Uh, re really exciting. I mean, I, I really appreciate the news reporting on the baby being born as that flight came into uh, Ramstein. Matter of fact, uh, there, there's actually been more than that. So it's just a just an incredible, incredible operation uh ongoing uh you know just just impressive work by our great airmen all right so more than that. yeah what did more you mean by that? that i'm sorry what did you mean by more than that more than one baby how many babies <laughs> so you're asking if there were more than one baby no no other yeah, babies my, my 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 well my last data point was three i i don't have a formal tracker but those are the you know so we'll, we'll, we'll keep you posted. All right, sir. All right, we'll, we'll, follow, we'll follow up and try to get you information on the other two. Listen, we got to let the general, we, we have to let the general get. Uh, one last surprise, though, at, uh, at Ishkaya, um, General Lyons, uh, we've, had, we've heard some concerns that there wasn't enough food or water for all the evacuees at the airport. Could you just talk about the efforts to fly in more sanitation, more MREs, more water for those that are trying to flee Kabul? Sure. Uh, well, you see all those aircraft going in there, and we never want to send an aircraft empty if we can't, so if we don't have to. So, uh, CENTCOM is managing that. We've got plenty of capacity going in there, and there, and there is sustainment on those flights coming in that we're taking evacuees out. So, uh, that you know, CENTCOM is addressing that issue. Thank you, uh, General. We're going to let you go unless you have any closing thoughts. Anything that you might want to just uh, hit at the end here. Well, John, I just, again, thanks for being part of this today, but I, I you know, again, uh, how proud I am of our mobility airmen just operating around the globe. It's just impressive to see. And, uh, you know, everybody is just in this all in, uh, rowing as hard as we can. And we're going to make this happen. I'm absolutely confident of that. Thank you, General. Thanks for your time today. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see you back here uh, mid-morning tomorrow. Thanks very much. Thank you. Do you have any updates what? on the evacuation? Please? I don't. No, I please. Can we get an question? Sure, you want to? Yeah.
could be evacuated from uh, Kabul after the US military leave the airport. So who would be uh, uh, secure, who would secure the airport, the Turks? How, I, I don't, how would it work? I don't know, Sylvia. My point was simply that um, uh, that it that it's it's certainly possible that the airport would maintain operations going forward. I mean that would be for uh, local authorities to figure out. Uh, but that um, but it, it is certainly possible that commercial traffic and charter traffic can still flow once the U.S. military mission is over. I, I couldn't speak to that with. Uh, you know, with great specificity, because that would be beyond what we're doing. But I, I just was making the point that um, just by virtue of the United States military leaving doesn't mean that that everybody else is 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 going to leave and not and not continue to fly aircraft out of there. That's all. That's, so, all, that's all I was saying. So it means that it, it, you would count on the Taliban to accept that people it, would leave. Right? It's not us counting on the Taliban, Sylvie. Um, uh, we have a, a mandate to continue to conduct this evacuation until the end of the month. You heard the general. We're focused on that. Uh, that's the goal we're shooting for. Uh, beyond that, when there's no U.S. military mission there, it's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not able to speculate or hypothesize of what that would look like. I'm just, all I was saying to Courtney's earlier question was it's possible that other carriers and other aircraft would be able to take off and land out of Hamid Karzai International Airport. Uh, regarding the incident uh, outside the North Gate uh, at the airport, uh, we've heard reports that actually American gunfire caused the injuries of the Afghans. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you confirm that? I cannot. Uh, uh, I've seen similar reports. I think it's really important, Wafa, that we uh, that we let the that we let the people on the ground uh, get their best estimate and idea of of what happened, and and that we don't try to uh, do the forensics here uh, at the Pentagon. Um, fluid situation, dynamic situation, serious threat environment. Our troops have the right to defend themselves. They believe they were under threat, and and they reacted accordingly. I don't want to get into second guessing that uh, right now, and certainly uh, in such a short span of time after the event. And those wounded were civilians or armed? Do you have? It is my understanding, and I caveat this with all reports coming out uh, originally, usually are not always completely accurate, but it is my understanding. That, that the wounds were sustained by other Afghan forces. Mm -hmm. And we, when you said uh, one member of the Afghan forces was killed during this incident, how did you identify that he was like uh, the Af Our from commanders the Af on the ground. Was he in uniform? How you, can, you couldn't tell if he's Taliban or? Well, I don't know what, what clothes he was wearing. Our commanders on the ground reported that uh, it was a member of the Afghan forces who was killed in action. We have no reason to doubt that report. Anything else, Laura? Yeah, um, just you mentioned earlier today, I can't remember if it was you or, or General Taylor, that um, there was a second rotary airlift evacuation mission out of Kabul. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what USS is the threat to these missions and these aircraft from ISIS-K, from the Taliban? Um, are there issues with R RPGs? How do you make sure that these... Yeah, I think you do understand. I want to be a little careful here, uh, Laura. Uh, I would just say that uh, commanders on the ground have the authority to conduct uh, local missions as they deem appropriate to the need. And we charge them with assessing the risk uh, with anything that they're doing. Um, and the secretary trusts uh, that they understand what the risks are and are appropriately factoring in whatever the risk environment is uh, before they actually before they do anything. So uh, while I can't speak and won't speak to uh, specific threat streams around the airport, um, I can tell you that our commanders are factoring in uh, all, kind, all manner of potential risk before they conduct any operation. Jake Sullivan earlier talked about the threat from ISIS-K to the airport. Is there a threat from ISIS-K to these operations as well? I won't speak to specifics of the threat, but uh, we know that ISIS uh, is, uh, is, is uh, certainly in Afghanistan. 
um, and uh, and we're mindful of the potential threats that they could pose to security at the airport and to the safe movement of, of, of people. Or Has the U.S. paid the Taliban for the freedom of movement or transport of any U.S. citizens? No. Has there been any financial consideration paid to the Taliban over the since Not August? that I'm aware of. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Yeah. Thanks, guys.